Welcome everybody uh, to uh, this virtual colloquium. It's kicking off our spring series. In particular, welcome to the visiting graduate students. I don't think we were exactly envisioning to have it this way, but it's still very good that we can do this because I think uh, it brings all of us virtually together. And uh, I would like to say it's a special pleasure for me to uh, introduce the speaker today, my quantum information theory uh, colleague, James Whitfield. Um, a few words uh, for those of you who don't know him. Uh, James uh, started his quantum journey um, as an undergraduate uh, at Morehouse College in, uh, in Atlanta. And then from there, moved up uh, to the Northeast in Harvard University as an undergraduate first, and then as a graduate student uh, in the group of Alana Spurogusi, who is one of the pioneer of uh, uh, application of quantum computers to quantum chemistry and electronic structure, which has remained one of the centerpieces of James' research. Um, James obtained a PhD in 2011, then he moved uh, on to two postdoctoral stages, the first one at Columbia University, uh, under Boris Altschuler in condensed matter theory, and then in Europe, in Vienna, working with Frank Verstrete. So by then, uh, we were in 2015. Then that is when I uh, met him in a conference in Maryland. And by then, he was looking for a job as a faculty. And uh, the rest you can imagine, we were lucky enough to be able to hire him here. Uh, where he has um, set up um, a group, a research group uh, in quantum information uh, theory. And uh, that's what he will be uh, telling us about in today's colloquium. With that, I would like to uh, give the floor to James. And uh, for all of the uh, participants, I would also like uh, the audience know that um, we will take question through the question and answers uh, feature that you should all uh, see in the Zoom uh, console. So James, take it out, bye. Okay, excellent. Let me start my slides here. Hello everyone. Welcome to our first virtual colloquium. Uh, we'll see how this goes, right? So uh, let me start my presentation. Charger wires did not do. Okay. Switch here. Okay. All right. So uh, today, uh, April 3rd, um, the title of this talk is Quantum Technology Here and Now. Um, the subtitle is a bit of a joke. Um, and not a very funny joke, but a joke about the fact that we're talking about here and now, and it's usually very broad when people say here and now. I mean, here at Dartmouth College, um, I'm basically on campus now, uh, and now meeting April 3rd, 2020 at 4.05 p.m. Okay, so this is when we're talking about quantum technology. I want to put these things in context, and I thought this was a really nice opportunity for one, for me to talk about the research that my group has been doing and myself have been doing, as well as to talk about Dartmouth more broadly and the quantum information science that's going on here. I think this is a really nice time to do such a thing because first, this is the beginning of the term. It's a nice time for us to take a second to reflect. Also, we have all the incoming graduate students and a lot of you guys may not be involved in my research, may not be involved in quantum research, but it's still nice that everyone has a good sense of what's going on here at Dartmouth, especially now that we all moved to digital spaces. So um, that's what we're gonna try and get through. Um, today's talk um, will be basically three parts. We're gonna talk about zooming in from quantum technology, quantum computing and quantum simulation, a very big view of the world and what quantum technology is doing, what it's for and why people are doing it. Then we'll talk about our research here. Um, and then we'll talk about our outreach from here. Um, so we've done a lot of our outreach inside the quantum area. We've done a lot of research in the quantum area and we're part of a much larger quantum discussion that's going on around the world. So I'll try and give you a tour of those things. Um, so I thought zooming as far out as I can 
to get you a sense of what quantum technology is. I thought it started out to make sense to zoom all the way out to what the word means, right? We're not going to go into too many technical definitions about what quantum means. But what I do want to do is give you a sense of how these things fit together. So we talk about physics. Okay, physics is from natural things. We talk about nature. We talk about physics. Um, this is the Department of Physics and Astronomy, so I don't think I need to elaborate very much on that. However, computers um, is a more interesting topic that doesn't come in at the same um, philosophical and technical level that I mean it when I talk about it inside this talk, right? So in our, in our, in our everyday work with computers, normally we think of digital computers, we think of the laptop you're on or the phone you're using or some digital device. However, when we think of computers, it might behoove us to also think of computers as entities that can compute a person. Okay. Um, uh, but then quantum technology, I, I think I heard this joke at a talk that I was said, and I thought it was a fantastic way of explaining what quantum technology is. So we already have quantum mechanics, right? So the idea of quantum technology is we want to translate from quantum mechanics to quantum engineers, right? So you think of a mechanic who just fixes the car to an engineer who's supposed to design the car. You can think of quantum technology going from quantum mechanics to quantum engineering, to actually building devices, to actually fabricating um, sensors and things of this sort that will really help us use quantum mechanics to our advantage inside of a large variety of areas. For instance, uh, building better atomic clocks has a lot of military applications because then submarines can stay underwater longer and know where they're at uh, and know what time it is in a better sense. Right? So a lot of these things are coming about and there's a lot of application areas both inside the um, civilian and inside the military and inside of uh, computational technology and where we'll be focusing and where my group is focused mainly has been on quantum simulation. Um, before we get to that, let's take a second and appreciate the worldwide effort of this uh, quantum industry. So here is a, a large number of uh, different places. We have, um, we have Russia, we have China, we have Australia, Canada, India, European Union, okay, this is Vienna, I was there, um, Singapore, and of course, United States, and all these countries investing around a billion dollars, uh, three, uh, three quarters of a billion dollars, $1.1 billion, but there's a huge amount of money coming in, huge amount of effort going into, um, going into understanding and using quantum technology, developing quantum technology, trying to push forward a, large, a lot of the ideas that I'll try and get you a big, broad overview of today. Okay. So apart from it just being a worldwide effort with a large amount of um, government support from a variety of governments from a large part of the, the world, right? Um, every country is doing financially well has pretty much invested in quantum technology. And the reason is that a lot of the businesses that are housed inside of these different continents and countries also have been putting a lot of money behind quantum technology. There's some companies that work actually on the technology. So there is IMQ, for instance. Um, there's also D-Wave. Um, IBM and Google all build quantum computers. Um, Rigetti also builds quantum computing devices, but companies like Boeing or Honeywell might also be interested in something like sensors for an airplane to know how something's happening. There's a lot of uh, technology companies that are focused on, um, on software development, thinking about how to use a quantum computer. Cold Qantas trying to build uh, BEC in a box, uh, very simple devices of that sort. Microsoft is working on topological quantum computers. Toshiba, um, Hewitt Packard, Nokia, Alibaba is leading the Chinese effort. Um, AT&T is working on quantum cryptography to make uh, quantum secure communication channels. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on. IBM, uh, we'll have reason to come back to a bit later. But this is just a picture to get across the idea that quantum computing is a growing industry with a lot of people putting a lot of effort into it. Um, and one of the things that I was at, what seems like almost a world ago, was in November, somehow seems very far away from now. Um, I was at the uh, Future Symposium on Achieving a Quantum Smart Workforce. And there, it's a lot of the questions of how do we go from um, a bunch of governments supporting quantum technology to an industry that needs people who know how to use quantum technology. And I'll talk a bit about how we're addressing that here at Dartmouth and in my research group um, when we get towards the end of the talk. 
So what's the point? Why is everyone doing this? Um, there's an old joke that used to use used to work really well when my audience was much older. Um, so now that a lot of people in the audience are younger than me and a lot of people in the audience are older than me, it works half the time. So we're going to try it here and see how it goes. Um, okay. So there was this notion of IBM compatible that goes back to the beginning of a consumer computing. Uh, IBM invented a computing device um, that could solve uh, that could run uh, small programs and they didn't patent the hardware. So they released this hardware and then what happened that everyone started writing or making IBM compatible software, or IBM compatible hardware, and then you could run the same software in any IBM compatible software, hardware. And the idea was that, uh, okay, it cost IBM perhaps a large amount of money, but it also helped in the development, the wide scale adoption of, of computing uh, at the consumer level. So here, what's happening with quantum computing is something called BQP compatible instead of IBM compatible, it's now BQP compatible. This just says that your computational device, whatever quantum computer you built, whether um, it needs to have some initialization, it can, should be able to run quantum algorithms, it should be able to run some measurement. But in the end, if you've written, if you made hardware that runs BQP compatible algorithms, then it should be able to simulate a Hamiltonian in the same amount of time it was it took to simulate it. Okay, so that's almost using the same exact word, but um, the difference is, is that if you think of trying to do a simulation, uh, you can imagine crashing cars into a wall and you're just simulating the dynamics of a car crash, right? Or you could talk about modeling a computation where you're actually putting in all the variables, you're using a finite element solver trying to figure out where, uh, what, which crumple zones were, are likely to, uh, to compress, right? So when you approach things that way, you're doing computation rather than simulation. We approach things in quantum computing, we're gonna think of simulation. And so you wanna simulate for twice as long, then the actual system would have taken twice as long to do the same simulation, right? So if you wanted to imagine how much more complicated it is to crash a truck than a SUV, than a um, car, then you just set them all up on the same track and run them into the same wall and you're done. But if you set, think of setting up the finite element simulations of these, it can be very different. And so this is where the difference between quantum computation, quantum simulation, and just computation in general come in. So with all those words that I just said, the main thing you should take away from this is that the place where we expect quantum computers to give us the best advantage is in simulating quantum time evolution. Classically, we expect that it should take an exponential, an exponential amount of effort to simulate a quantum system. This is because the amount of correlation within the quantum system grows exponentially in time. This is the entanglement. Um, and so as the entanglement grows, uh, sorry, grows linearly in time, excuse me, um, the entanglement grows linearly in time, which causes classical algorithms to need an exponential description to follow that description. There's also a lot of effort inside of quantum computation to work on optimization. A lot of the companies, a lot of the algorithms, and some of the hardware that's not necessarily BQP compatible is still available for use in optimization algorithms. Um, lastly, there is a whole effort that's been going on for many years, large discussion that I will mention um, perhaps later, is this idea of solving hard classical problems with the quantum computer. Um, so when you try and solve this, is, you could read this as just classical problems. But if you want to solve classical problems using quantum hardware, we expect generically only a quadratic speed up, which means that if it, something took you 100 units of time to solve, if you used a quantum computer, it would take you only 10 units of time to solve. Okay. So now zooming in from this very large global picture of the quantum world, let us take a second and appreciate quantum technology here and now. So the here part also refers to um, the reason. So as Lorenzo mentioned, she uh, mentioned that there was an open hire here at Dartmouth. And when I heard that, I started looking at um, some of the work that had been going on here and knowing some of the, the, my colleagues beforehand, particularly Lorenzo, um, it was a really exciting place to come. And so I will say that here, quantum information science is not just our research group. And so as we zoom in, I wanted to take a second to shout out to my colleagues and point out that we have a lot of exciting quantum information science happening here at Dartmouth. Um, one of the things that we've been making a lot of effort to do is try and make better coordination. We have a lot of ideas. We have now some joint grants. A lot of the tools that we're using are being shared across different uh, 
across different researchers. We have experimental colleagues um, who can address some of our questions and thoughts about what's realistic, what's not realistic. And it gives us a very nice place to do quantum information science here as a research group and as a researcher. Okay. Um, and then I think uh, an introduction to quantum computing would probably not be complete without mentioning the quantum supremacy experiment from 2019. Um, this is a major breakthrough inside of quantum computing where Google used a quantum processor to solve a problem that is known to be hard classically. Um, it's constructed to be hard classically. So the problem wasn't necessarily interesting, but I think the best analogy that I've heard or best analogy I've heard used, especially at this level that we're trying to aim for a colloquium is to think of uh, this is the Kitty Hawk flight, right? So this is just getting off the ground, you know, scanning a little bit of the, the airway and it's landing, right? So you haven't really done anything. You can't start sending mail across the country. You can't start um, shipping packages and, and uh, you know, maybe dropping bombs or whatever may be the case. You, you're not gonna get to these things with just a Kitty Hawk flight. Right? So you really need something much bigger. And quantum supremacy, the same idea is there. This is just a way of showing that quantum computers aren't just theoretical, that it's not just an idea. People ask, are there real quantum computers? They're real quantum computers, cloud accessible quantum computers, which we'll again talk about towards the end of the talk. We mentioned IBM's work in, in their uh, very large ecosystem of quantum technology that they've already developed. Yeah. So um, with that aspect of the introduction completed, let us turn a little bit to, um, more detailed appreciation of qu what quantum information is and what um, our research does in this area. So uh, I wanted to start off with this idea. So I, I'm teaching um, physics 116, which is quantum information science. And this morning, we just had the chance to talk about information as a physical construct. Um, so I'm just going to leave that there and just say information itself is physical. Uh, I'm going to trust you to come up with your own analogies. For instance, if I say it's physical, you can think that right now I'm speaking. My thoughts are being um, communicated amongst themselves through ion channels, which are pumping potassium and, uh, and sodium out of channels. This is allowing neurons to fire. Then that's where the information is stored. The information then translated to mechanical motions inside my mouth and inside of my larynx. That is then compressing air. The compressed air is then transduced into um, a microphone pickup and so on and so forth is transmitted to you. The photons are coming out of your out of your screen, um, and the sound system's playing back whatever my voice is. And that information, the entire transmission of the information, I went through in detail to illustrate this idea of information being a physical thing. It's not possible to have information that's not physically stored. Um, and at least that's the idea behind Landauer's principle. Um, and, and I should also point out here, as I did earlier uh, with my class, is that when I say information, I don't mean the meaning of the information, the semantic that the semantic properties of that information. So when I get a textbook or a quantum bit, um, if it doesn't mean anything to me semantically, then I'm maybe I'm not solving computation, but I'm learning about an atom, I'm learning about a mechanical system, I'm learning about some property of the world. Okay. So you still think in that case information is still physical. Okay, and there's a picture of our qubit, the nice blotch sphere. Um, Now, I think a little more important for what we're going to talk about here is this notion of computation being physical. Um, computation being physical is a, a really interesting idea that also takes serious this idea of the connection between physics and computation. Um, and so with this idea of connecting physics and computation, I have a couple of different icons just to kind of um, run you through the main ideas. So here's just the mechanical adding device. Um, this does computation by mechanically moving around parts. And as parts move around mechanically, then you can see what the addition is or whatever the, the mechanical, whatever the uh, function you're computing, A plus B or A times B or whatever it is that you wanna look up. That's an example of physical computation. And as I mentioned in the beginning, um, I, I think it behooves you to think of computation as beyond just digital computers, right? And if we think of that um, aspect of computation, then what we have inside of the second um, iconic picture is a picture of uh, computers from, I believe, World War II, um, where this is just a large number of women with mathematical proficiency who couldn't find jobs as mathematicians. Um, and 
back then, the main thing that they would do is become computers, right? They would actually compute properties or functions that are needed for some um, particular application. In this picture, it's probably from World War II, um, where they're thinking about uh, computing ballistics tables, right? And it was a huge effort to do this at scale. On the left-hand side is a really interesting picture that is from Charles Bennett, where he talks about uh, the thermodynamics of computation. Um, and again, you're gonna, in his paper, he takes computation as a physical activity, as a physical construct, is not just um, crunching through numbers. It's not just doing an integral. It's actually how did this physically get done? Who's physically transmitting the information? Um, for those of you with some background in, in biology, these are ADP and ATP. This is just showing a very simple um, biological computer that can solve simple things that you'd expect from a Turing machine, um, which again, is just a way of formulating computation. Um, over here in the bottom corner is a picture of a number of different quantum um, information technologies, some of which we have here at Dartmouth, um, NMR, um, superconductivity, we have some research groups working on that, ion traps. Um, okay, these are all not exactly applied to quantum technology here in at Dartmouth, but nonetheless, we have the infrastructure and technology to approach some of these things, and the expertise also to address questions at a, uh, at a, at a, at a to address questions. Okay. So then to motivate this idea of quantum computation rather than quantum information, um, I like to start off a lot of my talks with this idea of Schrodinger's conversation piece. This is the idea that the Schrodinger equation itself governs how quantum computers um, work. There is a physical qubit, which is some um, spin trapped inside of some lattice. Um, so in the case of NMR, it would be the nuclear spin. Um, for optics, it would be the um, photons polarization. The quantum gate then allows these things to be coupled. And there has to be some sort of way of doing a measurement to read out what the outcome state was. Um, and all of these evolutions are dictated by Schrodinger's equation. However, at the same time, Schrodinger's equation is not something we can solve. So here I have a quote from Dirac, and it says, the underlying physical laws necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are thus completely known. The difficulty is only that the exact application of these laws leads to equations much too complicated to be soluble. So what this is essentially saying is that, okay, we can build a quantum computer, um, and that quantum computer can, can be used to, um, to help us understand Schrodinger's equation. However, building a quantum computer also requires us to understand Schrodinger's equation. So then in this snake eating its tail, and you get to this very nice point um, that I think you have a crossover in the development of computers. When you first have your first mechanical computer computing whatever it computes, you, or maybe you have a, a 14 kilobytes of, 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 memory, of memory, then you get to a point where you have computers that are big enough to run CAD and these, um, and these, these tools for helping designers design better computers. And then using a computer to design the next computer, right? You would never design the next computer by hand in a sheet of paper. No, you'd use the old computer to make the new computer. And so hopefully we get to a point with quantum computing that the new quantum computer helps build the next quantum computer. This is one of the ideas that we have that we're working on with my colleagues um, uh, uh, here at Dartmouth. Okay. So that is a big picture of all the concepts and ideas um, that I wanted to get across. Um, I'll pause to see if there are any questions. Or is this just awkward? Because it feels awkward. No questions in the Q&A box right this minute, James. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it so much. Um, yes, yeah, so, so now what I want to get into next is, um, just a, a, a look at our research here. It's gonna be a um, overview of our research here, but I hopefully it'll get you a sense of what we're working on, why we're working on it, um, and how it fits into this larger picture that I've tried to sketch. Um, from there, we'll talk a bit about our outreach, um, some of the work that we've been doing here at Dartmouth and beyond, um, some of the work that we've been doing in Dartmouth, with Dartmouth, and outside of in the local area at Dartmouth. So again, quantum technology here and now.
So my research group is not particularly small. Um, we are at 10 people, uh, including myself, obviously. Um, but our research group is 10 people. Um, we have a lot of undergraduates. We have uh, three, four graduate students. We have four graduate students and one postdoc. Um, more on the way. Um, uh, Andrew Kupo is also a uh, nominally in our group as well, um, but he's not in the picture. Sorry. Uh, but what I'd like to say about our research group is that we are 10 people um, at various levels of expertise. Um, we have two PhDs among us, and um, we have to pick topics that do not compete with the larger companies and research groups and research divisions. And so we try to do that. And what I want to give you a sense of is what projects we really focused in on to really make quantum here and now something that we can accomplish, something that we can contribute to, and something that we can really make some improvements on. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the um, educational aspects of what we're doing. And hopefully this will give you a sense of a flavor and a sense of what sort of projects we're pursuing in order to make sure that our research doesn't get washed out, and that it's useful, that it's applied, and that we can, next time something comes up, we'll be able to apply our tools to it. So one of the major areas we work on is fermion to spin transforms. Um, this is slightly out of order, but it's not a huge deal. Um, we'll roll with it. So here are a set of qubits. And on the other side is some molecular system. And um, we want to understand the molecular physics of the system, meaning that we want to take the fermionic degrees of freedom, the electronic degrees of freedom, and all the electronic degrees of freedom of the system and map them onto the qubits such that we can simulate the electronic degrees of freedom with our qubit degrees of freedom. Um, Right, so it's a little messed up. Um, there's a fermionic algebra. I guess it's not so important what the equations say because either you know what the equations say or you don't. Not a huge deal if you don't. But the idea is that these fermions, um, which is, is a particular type of particle, um, electrons are, are fermions as well as other types of particles as well. But nonetheless, when we say fermions, you can also read this in electrons depending on um, how comfortable you feel. But we're trying to understand how to map the electronic behavior to the behavior of the qubits, the spin systems that we have control over. So in particular, we have some creation annihilation operators, like raising along operators that you might have came across inside of, um, inside of a, a discussion of the harmonic oscillator or something. In that case, it would be bosonic cre creation annihilation operators. In this case, we're referring to fermionic um, particle creation annihilation particle, um, operators. These operators create a fermion at a particular location or remove a fermion from a particular location. Um, but on the other hand, when we talk about spins, right? if you have m different spins, then um, these m different spins will always be there. There's never a case that you don't have the spin. Whereas in the case that you have m different locations that put an electron, you may or may not have an electron at that location. Whereas spins are both fi fixed in space and occupied by whatever is there in space. So this is one way you can appreciate that the algebra has to be different. Another way is that when we talk about uh, spin systems, these are addressable, meaning that I can talk about spin system one, spin system two, and spin system three, or I can relabel this as A, C, and B. However, when I talk about electrons, um, we cannot talk about labeling the electrons in any sensible way, right? Then being indistinguishable particles means that they're indistinguishable as long as the wave function is overlapping. Whereas we have qubits, we, even if we use electrons as our degree of freedom for the qubits, we confine it to separate spatial locations such that we can individually address each, um, each electron or spin. So one of the major tasks that I, I recognize and, and identified and has been really interesting as a, as a research area is how to map from the fermionic algebra to the spin algebra. Turns out this is far less trivial than we had anticipated and um, this is actually where I wanted to begin. Um, yeah. And so one of the simplest ways of talking about spin to fermion transform is this so-called jordan Wigner transform, which is highlighted here in the circle. Um, yeah. So before I go on to that, let me just say a few words about what this diagram is. This is a diagram from one of my earliest papers, um, 2010 or 11. I don't know. Um, in any case, you have a Hamiltonian here. This Hamiltonian is then decomposed into a sum of smaller Hamiltonians, which would be easy to compute. There's the so-called Trotter decomposition, which then says that we're going to take a bunch of non-commuting exponentials, exponentiate them, and we get some u, 
which is our time ev evolution operator. This time evolution operator, in terms of the creation annihilation operators, is not useful for us in terms of qubits. So we convert it to qubit operators, go to phase estimation, and we can read out the energy. Okay, so I'll go through some of these, some parts of these in more detail. But what I want to talk about for now is just this fermion to spin transform. Um, and here, uh, so this fermion to spin transform is allowing us to put the model system that we're interested in onto the quantum computer. This algorithm phase estimation is allowing us to read out what that energy level is. So you can really think of this entire region as doing spectroscopy. This entire region is doing the time evolution required for spectroscopy. Um, and then, uh, yeah. then here are the three researchers who were working on it in my research group. So Kanav Satya, um, Riley Chin, and uh, Shah Zue. Uh, Shah has left and uh, moved down to Boston to work on, um, on um, electronic structure at a pharmaceutical company. Um, so all this started out with um, looking at some of the oldest papers, some of the older papers about different ways of doing the mapping. And then it ended up growing into this very large research area where we have contributions um, in a large number of directions. Um, generalized superfast transforms, Ravagatev superfast transforms, senior thesis, which we'll talk about, um, auxiliary fermion mappings. We have the Fenwick tree, which is along the same lines. Um, we looked at hydrogen lattices and molecular simulations. There's a nice connection to lattice gauge theory, which uh, Riley has been has been working on for the last uh, since COVID outbreak and before that even. But nonetheless, the idea is still um, that this is something we're actively working on. Okay. Right. And alongside this, one of the nice things is that a research group has been not just doing these things and making up these papers and just thinking of ideas and writing them down. We've also been implementing them inside of um, open source software. So an open fermion is a open source project backed by the um, Google research group. QuizKit is an open source package and actually a collection of open source packages uh, backed by the IBM research group. And on both of these, our research group has um, credits um, in terms of contributions. Pi SCF is another program that's for electronic structure, classical program, that we also have um, group credits for contributing code to. So uh, that's just to say that here at Dartmouth, we're doing actual industrial level research. We're actually contributing. We're trying to do good work and think of good ideas, apply them to things, and see how well they work. Okay. Um, yeah. We also have WIS students and senior thesis projects along these same lines. Um, so then taking a second to, um, again, look at this, this map here, which is what we're gonna use kind of as our tour guide of our research. Um, we have the Trotter decomposition, the Jordan Magnet transform we just discussed. We can also talk about the structure of the wave function once it's on the quantum computer. The structure of the wave function, we've had quite a bit of work into this direction. Um, James Brown, has been working with me for several years now, um, three, I believe. And he is very interested in doing a lot of work with numerical studies, um, implementing um, complicated numerical procedures. And one of the more interesting things that um, has really come in, in into a very nice way with our research is thinking about how do we actually write down the wave function instead of interesting ways? How do we actually represent the wave function in ways that are non-trivial and that work well? So in the previous slide, I mentioned that we were looking at the spin to fermion transforms and some of them are akin to lattice gauge theories. So if you don't know what a lattice gauge theory is, hopefully you at least caught the first word of what I said, which is lattice. Okay, so lattice is the most important of the lattice gauge theories from the point of view that I'm speaking on um, in the sense that if we have functions that look like lattice points, then we can talk about using lattice gauge theory in a sensible way. However, if you have functions that are extremely delocalized, when we actually tried the mappings that were close to lattice gauge theories, they actually performed very poorly because it's almost as if everyone's connected to everyone. And then your lattice is basically a bunch of lines where every point's connected to every point. And somehow that's not a very useful way to do the simulation. Okay, so with that said, the main idea of what um, some of the work that James has been working on is looking at different basis sets, different ways to represent the electronic wave function. In this paper on the Wilson basis functions, what we did was look at phase space localized basis functions. So we have basis functions localized in both the momentum and in position space. And then we wanted to see how well this performed for electronic structure. 
The plan is to then apply this alongside the uh, spin to fermion mappings that are most appropriate for localized basis functions, lattice-like basis sets, and then see if we can actually make some progress in that direction. So we already have some work going along those directions and um, that's to be um, seen soon. Uh, this generalized poly constraints and small atoms is a fantastic side project that I did, that I started when I was a postdoc. And it actually turns out to be extremely interesting that if you have a pure quantum state, um, which means that the, okay, you have a pure quantum state, then there are additional constraints on what the um, eigenvalues to the reduced density matrix can be for the one body reduced density matrix. Okay, now if that's not interesting to you, I'm sorry, but if you know anything about reduced density matrices, that's a, a completely fantastic fact um, that I didn't actually expect to be true. It turns out that we can show that it's true both numerically and um, we had some ideas of applying it to small atoms. So generalized poly constraints. Um, we also have a lot of efforts inside of my research group in looking at group theory and trying to apply uh, different ideas from representing finite groups um, to simplify quantum chemistry calculations on quantum computers. We had a recent paper with Kanav um, in the IBM group where we looked at using symmetries to reduce the cost of doing simulations as well. So um, this is just give you some sense of the activity inside of our group um, and hopefully it does that. So I mentioned phase estimation earlier. So this is just a way of doing measurements. So when we talk about doing quantum computers, we have this wave function, we talk about the structural wave function, how to map the wave function from a fermionic wave function to a spin wave function. But then that leaves us with the question of how do we actually extract information? So, yeah, okay. So we extract information um, and I'll go through this a bit slower, um, I believe. Uh, so Jun Yang has been in my research group for some time now, uh, well, for, he's in his third year, so for I guess two years, one year. In any case, um, June has completed a paper that we are in the process of submitting to a journal on quantum simulation, um, where it's measurement on quantum device application time dependent density functional theory. We'll get into the application of the time dependent density functional theory, but first I'd like to say a few words about measurement. Um, so when we talk about measurement, um, there's this paper that June's looked at, we have a solver, which I'll, I'll discuss a bit later, there's also some work at looking at cavity QED systems that we've done um, with the University of Maryland um, collaboration, thinking about how do we actually take a Ramsey, inter a Ramsey interferometer and then translate into a quantum algorithm or quantum protocol. This uh, measurement of quantum devices just looks at a number of different ways we can extract the information from the quantum computer. Um, and this sits well within the larger framework of all the ideas that our research group is working on and thinking through. Okay, did all that, all right. So with the remaining 20 minutes or so, um, but not even all of it, but with part of it, I wanna talk about density functional theory to elaborate a bit on um, that last project we were talking about density functional theory. So with density functional theory, this is an idea that you're gonna use the probability density instead of the wave function. So wave function is a rather complicated object. If there are n particles, it has three n coordinates and then three n plus another n coordinates if you include spin. So it ends up being a very large object, whereas the probability density only contains three coordinates and then four coordinates if you include spin again. Um, this is relevant for us inside of a physics department. Um, this is relevant for us inside of a biology department, basically inside of any department that has computational methods. Um, the top five papers by citation in the APS um, American, Physical, um, American Physical Society um, journals are all concerning density functional theory. It's arguably the most widely used method for electronic structure, and it's a very fast method with 1,000 to 10,000 calculations common for a single publication. So you can just run it, many different geometries, many different uh, configurations, and see what you get out. It turns out DFT is fantastic. It has hugely wide applicability, both in, uh, beyond electronic structure, talking about um, density functional theory for simulating liquids and things like this. Uh, in any case, all of these things, the density functional theory itself, the idea of replacing the wave function with the density is not enough to actually do anything uh, particularly useful yet. Um, what it actually turns out is that after um, Walter Cohn, so I probably should mention Walter Cohn um, is, the, is one of the founders of density functional theory, won the Nobel Prize in um, the 90s with uh, Walter, um, uh, 
with John Popel um, for electronic structure contributions, the two of them. Um, okay. So here, this cone sham system, so Lu sham also works in quantum computing now, um, I believe quantum, quantum experiments. In any case, the idea is it's cone sham system is that we want to take an interacting system where W here is our interaction. We want to go to a system that has no W, right? In order to go to a system that doesn't have W, we need to change the potential. So this V here and this V here are not the same. Um, this cone sham wave function, so we change it to a system that doesn't have any interaction. And then we're going to create this cone sham wave function, which will be different than a real wave function. But the idea is that this cone sham wave function should reproduce the same density as the real system, right? We're not trying to match any other property of the system other than the density. Um, that's the main point of doing this cone sham construction. You're going to build this fictitious system that reproduces the same density as the interacting system. Okay. Oh, I should also point out here, and this is worth pointing out, is that the same idea for a cone sham system applies in the static or the time dependent case. We're talking about this um, potential being a function of time or not a function of time. You, then if it's a function of time, then this density becomes a function of time. Um, and there's a few other things that have to change in order for the construction to work. But uh, for the purposes of our colloquium, it's not important. Okay. So what is important is how do we construct this cone champ system? So constructing the cone champ system is not an easy problem. For the ground state problem, it's very hard. In fact, you can make very nice computational arguments about how difficult it must be. Um, otherwise, you'd be solving problems you wouldn't expect that you'd be able to solve with a computer in any case, right? Um, so what we've done is there was a paper that I wrote uh, around the time I was a postdoc um, thinking about how to apply um, quantum computing to time-dependent density functional theory. Um, this algorithm that uh, we described inside this paper in New Journal of Physics um, has two parts to it, a quantum part and a classical part. Um, the classical part is just taking the data from the quantum computer, some output state from the quantum computer, reading it in, iterating, and giving back the cone sham potential in time that you needed to produce this particular density. In order to do that, you still need the density as an input. So you have a quantum computer with some input state, this quantum input state, some external potential which is dictating the time evolution. You allow this quantum system that you can control, um, this quantum system you're interested in, input state and potential. And then you evolve it on your quantum computer with some quantum information theory. Um, this idea going back to Feynman in the 1980s, um, a few other people have uh, various claims to this, uh, to this discovery as it were. Um, but in any case, the idea is that you have some quantum optics setup or whatever setup you have. We're gonna take the quantum system you're interested in, uh, follow some spin to fermion mapping, and then you're gonna have some time evolution that you, of the quantum system you control. Then you can measure the quantum system that you can control. You can control it, so you can have it evolve to time 2.7, stop, measure it, have it evolve to this time 2.8, stop, measure it, have it evolve to time 7.5 because you forgot something or you wanted to check that the data is continuous and then do the measurement again. So the idea is you're gonna measure the density at enough times so that you can feed this in, get out a time trace what the density is, you need a second derivative and some boundary conditions, and then this is enough to generate the cone sham potential in time, okay? This is interesting because it has some, um, some computational um, significant uh, points to it in that if you have ground state DFT, there should be no way a quantum computer can help you other than heuristically. Here, we can show that if you have time dependent density functional theory, a quantum computer would allow you to actually build that cone sham potential, that external potential that allows you to get rid of the interactions. Once you build the system without interactions, you can simulate this on your desktop. You can simulate this on another class of computer. You can just pass around the density as um, you can pass around the, the excuse me, pass around the cone sham potential as if it were just a small file, right? It won't be as large as compressing the full wave function. There's also the opportunity that if we have enough cone sham potentials to actually see if we can understand what's gone wrong with the classical approximations to the time dependent cone sham potential. Um, so these are all ideas that we're working on. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is a two-part project. So like I said, there's a quantum measurement and the, um, the classical um, time propagation. So we had this paper from uh, late last year, September, where we're thinking about measurement of quantum devices application to time-dependent density functional theory. 
So here, again, what we need to do is prepare the state. So we have some initial state, which you prepare to some circuit, some box, as it were. Um, and then this entire part on the left-hand side, you should think of if you, uh, if you have any uh, familiarity, think of it as a Ramsey interference experiment, right? You should think of it exactly like that. This is um, um, translating from population to coherences. You allow the time of evolution to occur and translate back from coherences to populations and measure the change in populations, right? You do this enough times, you get out a nice interference curve and you can see a decay and a lot of nice interesting properties from it. In this case, we don't want to measure um, anything. We want to actually measure the density. So this is the number operator um, from quantum mechanics. And so you want to measure this number operator. Um, and then we did this in several different ways, different protocols. In the end, we found that these different protocols have different levels of success. We even tested out our algorithm on Rigetti's quantum computer. So this is the actual time evolution from Rigetti's quantum computer. Here's some numerical examples with very simple Hamiltonians. And what we found is that um, the direct measurement, the simplest idea was the one that worked the best. Um, and we've done this for both a smaller system and a larger system. And right now we're in the process of extending this, making it a little more user-friendly that we can apply it to more systems and see how applicable this can be. Right, um, and so I'm almost at the end of my talk. There's another uh, 10, 12 minutes. So I wanted to say something about the future of what our group is working on. So a lot of these things I've talked about so far are not things that in the distant past, but these are things that we have thought about, things we've worked on, things that we're trying to bring to some sensible um, conclusion, um, maybe not final conclusion, but a sensible conclusion to pick new topics, to graduate students, to have uh, new opportunities, to hire new postdocs, uh, to bring in new undergraduates, a lot of ideas that we have, to bring in our undergraduates that we have already. So how do we actually make um, the future plan for what the Whitfield Group's gonna be working on and the thing that we've been working on and already started working on is this idea of the co computational quantum classical boundary. So this is a, a very famous Physics Today article by Wolchek Zurich, where he talks about the qu classical to quantum boundary. And if you look, it's a very cute picture with quantum on one side and classical on the other. And you can see in the classical domain, there's, there's uh, the sun and the planets and there's us. And then on the quantum side, there's quantum wave detectors um, the quantum bill of rights, you have to interfere if you can, Schrodinger's equation, and classical law and order do not interfere. So there's a bunch of things here that are um, fairly interesting between this border. But I think a lot of this idea is philosophically anyways, I think we're kind of washed out now that we're actually building technology with it. But now that we're building technology with it, we can ask the question of when is this technology effective? And when is it more effective than the old technology, right? So this is really looking for where the computational difference is between quantum and classical. As I mentioned earlier, there was um, the quantum supremacy experiment. This quantum supremacy experiment is designed for something as far away from the boundary as possible. Yeah, as far away from the boundary as possible. Um, and when you pick something as far away from the boundary as possible, you're picking an unstructured problem that may or may not be relevant for um, understanding realistic problems. So with that in mind, we started thinking a bit about uh, statistical Hamiltonian complexity. We're thinking about phase transitions instead of NP-complete problems. How do we understand this in terms of electronic Hamiltonian? How do we actually find which electronic problems are hard, which electronic problems are hard for a quantum computer, which electronic problems are hard for a ordinary computer, ordinary algorithms, and where's the boundary between um, the ones that a classical computer would find easy, and the ones a, class, a quantum computer would find easy, the ones a quantum computer would find easy, and the ones a classical computer would not. Right, that's where we really want to find this boundary. And even to find algorithms to show that perhaps there's no boundary. Perhaps every problem is easy to solve classically. Maybe it's easy to solve quantum mechanically, right? These are all questions that I think are still open and valid and reasonable questions to go into, especially with the amount of money that's been put in from governments, countries, and um, all sorts of people, right? yeah, VC capitalists, whatever else. Okay, this is out of order. Um, but we also have a paper looking at the solver for quantum computers. Um, and here is a video of the density expanding in time. Um, I really wish I had done this earlier, but we're here now. In um, any case, what this is a video of is the um, density. So if you look at the bottom potential, this is the potential in green. And then in purple is the density that's expanding in time. So here's a static picture of roughly the same process. 
there's a double well potential that the initial wave function knows nothing about. This wave function expands, and as it expands ballistically, it starts to realize there's a potential well here. And then as the time-dependent density functional solver starts spitting out what the potential needed to reproduce the correct density is, it also needs to include this potential well. And that's what you're seeing. The, the hash marks are the reconstructed potential in time, right? So if we look at the beginning, the density doesn't know anything because it's effectively zero here. So it doesn't know that there's a potential well there yet. And as it evolves, it starts to learn that there's a potential well, and then starts to fill everything in. So again, this is just taking the numerical method from the previous step after extract the density enough times to get some time trace of the density, then we can use a classical solver to try and reconstruct that confident potential. Right, that's what he said. Right. So with my remaining seven minutes or so, I wanna talk a little, bit about, a little bit about our research and our outreach that we've done. Um, so the research I gave you uh, hopefully was a nice overview, uh, perhaps a bit uh, light on details, but that's life. Um, it's a colloquium. I don't want to belabor all the details, but I want you to get a sense of what we're working on, why we're working on it, and how we're working on it, and what sort of ideas that we've come out of it. So let me pause and ask for any quick questions. No okay. questions pending right now. All right. Thank you. All right. So for undergraduates, we've had a lot of undergraduates participate in our research um, starting from the year that I arrived. And almost every year, okay, not 2020, we've had a senior thesis coming out of our research group. Um, the first one was approximating matrix product states with machine learning. Matrix product states are the, um, the classical end of quantum information. So if you take quantum information and try to see where you can use it without using a quantum computer, then you end up with matrix product states. Uh, benchmarking quantum computers with electronic structure algorithms. This ends up being closely related to a lot of the work that we do in our research group. Um, one of them disappeared, yeah. And then last year um, in May, we had constructing random ensembles of fermionic systems, which was the first step, uh, one of the first steps along this idea of setting up this question of which electronic systems are hard and which electronic systems are hard for class computers, which electronic systems are hard for, um, for uh, quantum computers. Okay, I'll, I'll check it afterwards, okay. Um, so we also participate in the Women in Science Project every year, including this year. We have two excited uh, Women in Science students who are rearing up to get started in the research projects this term. So it's been a very exciting time working with the undergraduates here at Dartmouth. Um, more broadly, we also work with the larger campus. We had IBM um, join us last January, a whole year ago. Um, yeah. yeah, so they joined us to talk about quantum information science. We had a very nice program that went all day. Um, we had a pizza programming set up where we just had a very open environment that fits very well with my own um, uh, preferences for teaching and, and how I like working with people and how I like interacting. It's just having open environments where people can play, where people can just have a set of tools in front of them. You go at your own pace, just keep going, be excited, enjoy it. You know, I want you here because you love science. I want you here because you love physics. I want you here because you love quantum information. And that's what we're here to do. Um, and so we opened up the space for anybody who's interested in coming into the space that we love, right? Um, and we had this pizza and programming event put on with the, um, with the research scientists and the, uh, sorry, research computing and the library um, where we actually had the IBM researchers come in and give some background. And so sitting with this nice idea of open space, go at your own pace sort of forums, we also introduced uh, a new teaching tool, and here's Kanab. Um, the teaching tool we demonstrated at the Hanover High School, and this was just in February, where we we're trying to think about how we can teach quantum better. So again, this is a, a small research group on the scale of what quantum computing is now. There's very large research groups with huge industrial efforts that have 20 or 30 PhDs that are all working towards making the device reality, towards a research paper, towards whatever. So we're trying to think how do we actually contribute from our position here at Dartmouth in our time and place now in the midst of this ongoing quantum revolution. And so one of the ways that we thought about this was introducing new teaching tools. And this gets us to this idea of QBRAID, which is a quantum computing platform that we've developed inside of our research group. Um, this project's being led by Kanav, where he's 
thinking a lot about um, how to actually teach quantum, how do we actually make quantum accessible to um, more people? How do we make it more accessible? How do we make it easier to learn? How do we teach it in the right way? You go on the internet and hear a lot of things about quantum crystals and, and quantum spirituality. And these things are all terrible things for people to read. Um, so if you're doing this, you're watching this on the internet, please don't do that. Don't go to those places. Don't interact with those things. Um, so we wrote QBraid to get at some students that we felt were being left out from the ongoing quantum technology revolution. There's been a lot of effort at larger institutions to build quantum platforms for education or just educational platforms in general. So MIT has a very huge um, open course uh, library and now they're handing out certificates for quantum and things like that. So um, they're focusing on a very different group than what we focused on. So eventually we wanna also write tools for undergraduates and graduate students in my research class now in the 116 course that I'm teaching are already using QBraid. Um, but the idea is we wanna make a platform for writing and learning quantum computing and it's already open to everyone. So if anybody from the department wants an account to play around and see what we've been doing. Please make one. Um, we can do it relatively easily. Uh, so check out QBraid. And then that brings me to the end of my talk with another three minutes left to spare. Um, the main idea that I wanted to get across here is that quantum technology is happening now, happening all around us. Okay, uh, COVID-19 did not stop the technology firms. So um, this is still ongoing. Active work is still going on here. We had our first group meeting on Thursday. Um, everyone's excited to get back to work. Um, oddly enough, the entire COVID-19 hasn't changed much in my workflow or my responsibilities. We saw the same, everybody, all my, recent, all my undergraduates from last term came back. Um, all of my graduate students are back, my postdocs back, um, and now we're continuing on our work on developing quantum simulation capabilities in quantum education. And with that, I'll leave the remaining time for questions. And then I guess we have coffee break. I don't know. Great, thanks James so much for your talk. Uh, we have one question on deck now. Let me just take this moment to say, uh, if you have a question, please do type it into the Q&A box and we will get to it in order. Uh, so this question is from Christina Lynch. I'm gonna quote her. Uh, she says, thank you, James. I'm curious to know what physics problem you personally are looking forward to throwing at the quantum, sorry, throwing the quantum computer capabilities at once they become more capable and the efforts move towards using the quantum computers rather than designing them. Okay, so if you'd asked me this uh, two months ago, I'd say a very different answer. Um, but given what's going on in the world now, <laughs> I would say the thing that would be most interesting to apply quantum computing to is understanding, um, you know, uh, 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 bio, bio, biochemistry. So understanding how binding sites work, you know, how do you actually get a drug to interact with, uh, with a microbe or how do we actually figure out what the binding site looks like? What are the actual uh, chemical processes that are occurring inside of a cell as it's being affected. So, I mean, I was talking to someone earlier today, we were talking about the application of quantum computing to the ongoing uh, COVID crisis. And right now there's not a lot of applications yet for quantum computing. Um, just because quantum computing is at a very early stage, I think as quantum computers get uh, more developed and the tool sets already there, then it will be easy to cut whatever you want. So I would say the, the most interesting thing, um, so I can give it also, the older answer I would have given um, was that we also have a very uh, we have a very big interest in our group of thinking about um, things that aren't quantum philosophy because I don't think this is a very um, well, I don't want to say anything about it um, but quantum philosophy but rather than philosophy quantum technology and the philosophy thereof so one of the major areas of quantum uh, technology that I think is one of the more fascinating areas that just seen major breakthroughs is the understanding of time. Um, we understand time by looking at um, atomic transitions. And I thought it'd be really interesting to see if you could simulate the atomic season clock transition on a quantum computer, because then no matter what answer you get out of the quantum computer, it's right, because that defines a second. So I thought that would be a really cool thing that no matter what answer you get out, it's correct. So, um, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, it's, it's always good to always be right. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't see any questions pending. I have one question. Oh, well, help, there they are, hello. Um, all right, so let's go with um, Ryan Hickox has a question, quoting him, thanks James. It's really interesting how researchers and QBraid users are able to interface with quantum computers remotely. Do you foresee there eventually being full-scale quantum cloud computing? 
Oh, that's a that's a great question, Ryan. So let me answer your question by saying there is already full scale quantum computing, uh, cloud computing. Um, the entire QuizKit network is basically built around the idea of cloud computing. This is IBM's network. IBM began they went to say, built their first or second quantum device, they started putting it online, allowing people to log in and run jobs there already. Um, and in the 116, students are already logging into cloud accessible quantum computers. Um, I think everyone who's building a quantum computer now, their major goal and idea is to build a quantum computer that has, um, that has cloud capability. And in fact, the entire the Google team hasn't put their quantum device available for cloud access. But, um, there was a David Bacon who was a top theorist in quantum computing many, many years ago, just left quantum computing and decided to go to industry and has been working on cloud computing at Google for many, many years. And now they're bringing him back in to work on the quantum cloud computing effort for Google. So hopefully that helps answer. If you get on QBrain, um, you'll have to do a few more steps to jump through, but you can log into a quantum computer quite quickly from there. Okay. Great. Great, and one more question from Alexander right. Smith, uh, quoting him, does the cone sham construction generalize to bases other than the position basis? That is the construction required the position density to agree with the original theory. Could one pick an observable different from the position operator and require the associated density to agree with the original theory? Could one then pick a basis of observables in the original theory, apply yeah. the construction for each element of the basis and reproduce the entire original theory? I am the smartest quantum person that is not a quantum person after reading that question. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so uh, there's some easy answers here and there's some things in it, I don't understand exactly what the question is saying at some points, but um, the, the answer to the question is, so the cone sham construction is, is very broad. Um, and the idea that for the cone sham construction is actually, is extremely, extremely loose. Um, so to give you, I mean, this is again, a colloquium, so we didn't go into too much detail, but let me say a few more words about, um, about the cone sham construction. So with this cone sham construction and your question is asking about how general it is, this cone, cone sham construction actually ends up being, um, you can use it for quantum computing in fact. You can use it for almost anything you want. Um, so here. So if we look at this cone sham system construction, the main thing is that you have some fixed part of the Hamiltonian, which is T and V. And so this is T and V plus some correction to V, but there's some interaction, right? So if you think of a spin system, you could have a local magnetic field and you have some ZZ coupling. The ZZ coupling would be this, um, interaction term, right? The interaction between the spins. And if you wanted to then build a system that had no more interaction between the spins, you could again build the spin system with a different potential that would then be time dependent, that would then reproduce the same dynamics in the Z expectation value, for instance, as the, um, as the other. Um, I don't know if that helps answer your question, but hopefully, um, yeah, so. Great. Okay, thanks, James. Um, that actually will lead very nicely into where we're going next. Number one, if you have further questions, we're going to have a virtual coffee out after this colloquium. Uh, Christina and Brian are hosting it. I'm going to put the link here um, in the chat so that you can all enter it. Note the password that you'll need to get into it. Uh, that's where we're heading to next. Um, I want to say thank you to James for the very nicely done colloquium, but also to all of our prospective students. We're really sorry that we weren't able to meet with you in person, but we hope you still got a sense of the vibrancy of the people and community here at Dartmouth. Um, so yeah. wishing you wellness and peace uh, to everyone as you move forward. Come to Dartmouth.